So I've had another morning, another keynote. It's currently 5 a.m. Uh, I was going to talk to you about AMD's new APUs, new Pro APUs, new mobile graphics on RDNA 2. That all went right out the window when they started talking about 3D stacking of chiplets. What's your minimum specification? Welcome to all of you around the world joining us for our Computex 2021 keynote. We're really excited to share some of the new products we've been working on this year. So let's split this video into two parts. First, I'm going to talk about what they announced and two, the feasibility of it all. So in Computex keynote, uh, AMD CEO, Dr. Lisa Su showcased a cache chiplet on top of a standard Zen 3 core complex. So this is a prototype Ryzen 5900X processor with the 3D chiplet technology. We've actually removed the lid from this package and exposed the left CCD so you can see one of the six millimeter by six millimeter square SRAMs hybrid bonded to the CCD. So as you might remember, Zen 3 has two core complexes and one IO die. So you have each core com complex is eight cores for a total of 16 cores. And then your IO die is built on Global Foundry's 14, 12 nanometer. That provides your IO. Your core complexes are built on seven nanometer. Now for eight cores, you have 32 megs of L3 cache on each chiplet. And what AMD decided to present is that they've designed a 64 megabyte ch uh, cache chiplet, SRAM cache chiplet, that they can place over one of those core complexes, or you know, one on each. So instead of having 32 megabytes of L3 cache per chiplet, you now have 96. That means in a 16 core processor, or as they presented a 12 core processor, you have six cores on each chiplet, 96 megabytes of L3 cache on each chiplet for a total of 192 megabytes of L3 cache. So we know that having more L3 cache is good for gaming, it's good for discrete gaming, and it's good for integrated gaming. Uh, what this means is when you need a cache line at say 50 megabytes, rather than going all the way out to main memory, the core will have prefetched the data and you can grab it from L3 cache. Uh, and it's uh, a lot lower latency, and that helps improve gaming over anything else. In our testing with designs that have more uh, sort of L3, L4 cache, for example, Intel's Broadwell had 128 megabytes of L4 cache. That was great in gaming, but unfortunately it didn't actually accelerate any other workload. So this seems to be very much a gaming play from AMD. Now the chip that AMD showed, uh, Lisa Su showed on stage, you know, standard Ryzen 5000 processor with its two uh, core complex chiplets. Uh, it had one die with the extra cache and one die without. So we got to see what looked like a little bump. Uh, AMD clarified that that is a six millimeter by six millimeter bump. So 36 square millimeters for 64 megabytes of L3 cache. What they're using here is TSMC's 3D fabric stacking technology. This is technically the SOIC chip on wafer technology, and they're using through silicon vias, so copper to copper interconnects between the main die and the cache die, and they've had to thin both to get that to work. Uh, TSMC has actually showcased this technology stacking 12 dies on top of one another. So this is only two dies and fairly simple by con. Now the whole point of having a chiplet with and a chiplet without was merely just to showcase the technology and the difference it has. Uh, I've got a feeling that AMD kind of want to integrate this into the same sort of package that the Ryzen processors do. And for actual performance on stage, no real concrete numbers aside from a Gears 5 benchmark at 1080p, where they showed a plus 12% frame rate increase in gaming. They showed a series of five games, uh, averaging about 15% across five games, anywhere from 4% in League of Legends uh, to 25%. They did clarify that the chiplets, the cache chiplets, was built on TSMC's 7 nanometer process. So now we've got a chiplet, a Zen 3 chiplet that's 80 square millimeters and a cache chiplet that's 36 square millimeters. So you're increasing the amount of silicon you need per processor per chiplet by about 50%. That's going to be interesting to see what it does during a silicon shortage. AMD has said that this technology is actually pretty much ready to put into production by the end of the year. Exactly in what products though, it's unsure. Normally with these sorts of new stacking technologies, they're expensive to implement. So they will naturally go into the higher performance products. Now, whether that's consumer 
high performance products we're unsure of. Uh, I would naturally think something like this would go into Epic first rather than Ryzen. Uh, but with AMD showing Ryzen at Computex with this technology, might be geared towards Ryzen. Now, interestingly enough, you know, rumors of Zen 3 Plus and Zen 4 and what have you, AMD said Zen 4 is uh, due for launch in 2022. Based on my calculations and when previous uh, processors have been launched from AMD, there's about a 14 to 18 month cadence. So given that we had uh, Ryzen 5000 on Zen 3 in Q4 last year, it makes sense that AMD's next generation Ryzen processor will be in Q1 in 2022. Kind of lines up with this technology. I really wonder where it's going there. One of the things to note is that uh, Zen 4 is meant to be on 5 nanometer, and uh, AMD was showcasing this chiplet uh, 3D stacked V cache chiplet technology on 7 nanometer. So it's going to be interesting to see if uh, AMD are going to keep with a 7 nanometer cache chiplet and a 5 nanometer core design, or whether they're going to go 5 plus 5. Uh, and then, you know, beyond that, what uh, process technology is the IO die going to be on? Uh, we may see a case of where AMD is using just multiple uh, process node technologies, more than two, in order to get their design across. So let's talk some of the technical aspects. Uh, AMD here is using through silicon vias or TSVs. This is literally a chip to chip connection uh, using uh, copper interconnects. This is different to Intel's Foveros, which is more of a die-to-die -die, um, micro-bump stacking technology. With Foveros, you have a chip with bumps, and then you have another chip with bumps, and you put them together, and that's how they connect. TSVs, on the other hand, are designed to go through multiple chiplets at once. We typically see TSVs in uh, memory in HBM. That's where they're used a lot. Now, the upside of TSVs is that you can stack really high. The uh, downside is, is it's mainly used for cache and memory, not really for logic. Because the problem when you have uh, stacked chiplets is that the chiplets that aren't at the bottom, you have to supply power to. Now, cache chiplets need relatively less power than a logic chiplet. If you have a logic chiplet, if you have cores on the top, you have to be able to supply power to them. And with TSVs, that means supplying power all the way from the substrate up to the top. The process itself requires a lot of power, but then you also have to design your chips such that any uh, any through silicon via that the power goes through, you have to actually do like a keep out zone to make sure that power doesn't interfere with any of the on chip signaling. Uh, so TSVs are good for doing cache because they're a lot less power. They're good for doing memory like HBM. Uh, not so good for logic. Intel's Foveros technology, because it's this micro bump on micro bump technology, is better suited for logic. And that's why they have their sort of IO die at the bottom in Lakefield and their core complex, their core chiplet at the top. Having the core chip at the top also helps with cooling, though, because then you're nearer the heat spreader, but you still have to manage moving that power up from the substrate up to that top chip. AMD is keeping the core complex on the bottom chip, which might have an effect on cooling. Uh, we're going to have to see how that happens. With AMD's design, they've said that even though the top chip is you know smaller than the bottom chip, they've, they've used additional uh, silicon stiffeners to keep the chip the same length. I'm sure that also helps with transferring thermals through the silicon, though again, it's still a bonded situation, so that might have lower thermal efficiency than just one unified piece of silicon. It's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out in terms of cooling. There might be an actual limit on how AMD can do this per chiplet as well. Um, or there might not be, it might be relatively easy to do within the confines of say a consumer power delivery workload. So AMD did provide some numbers, uh, including a 200x interconnect density compared to regular 2D packaging, a 15x density increase compared to microbump technology, which is you know a shot across the bow of Intel's Foveros, and a 3x better interconnect efficiency compared to microbumps. We've already seen the difference that having a large L3 cache makes when we compare APUs to CPUs in uh, AMD's portfolio when paired with a discrete graphics card. Having more cache is going to hit the law of diminishing returns, but it is going to help on some level. I just wonder what emerging workloads in the user space, like if we have accelerated AI in, uh, in the user space, um, as we go to more complex graphical interfaces, how much of that extra cash is going to help end users who are not gaming? 
it's going to be interesting to see if uh, AMD actually um, bifurcate its product lines between a gaming processor and perhaps a more workforce uh, oriented processor. Perhaps we'll get this technology on Ryzen, but not on Threadripper. That'd be an interesting thought. In the end, what's my minimum specification? Well, now I just want more cash, extra cash chiplets. Chiplets for everyone. Chips. Sounds good for a potato. Mm -hmm.